stringent norms on what kind of vehicles can drive on roads. And uh, so the future of classic cars on the roads in India in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the line uh, may not be the same as it is today. You know, you probably have to comply with a lot more uh, laws. Uh, but if we work together, I think, and uh, increase visibility, have a lot of uh, shows like this, drives, interactive, uh, you know, fairs, etc., and get lawmakers involved, then I think that we could get exemptions from the standard, you know, laws which would apply to other cars. Very interesting. So, what, what, can we just list a few more things and how else we can actually involve a lot of youngsters into it? Like today, also when we see, when we have collectors, we have, as you said, that you have your children who are kind of interested in it. But how do we actually make them more involved into the whole thing of, like how Cyrus you were mentioning, you know, that they, they, it's not a push. Nobody is, nobody gets pushed around. Youth don't really get pushed around. They will, they know exactly what they have to do. But more, uh, maybe interactive, more, uh, what? Do you have, do you come up with something where you feel that you can start that kind of a movement where we all get together? It's actually really simple. It's all about popular culture. Right. Uh, one movie changed the face of how cars are modified back in the 2000s. One movie, one series, the biggest grossing series in history, Fast and the Furious. It gave birth to a whole new generation of car lovers. People would not have been car lovers if that series of movies, I mean, the modifications in those movies were questionable and some of the cars made an era were questionable, but it gave birth to people who love cars today. Um, classic cars, though, it's a different ball game. You have to have some sort of in the liking for cars and not just be, oh, I want those kind of big wheels and chrome so that I look cool to my friends. It's different because most of your friends will still call you a moron for buying an old car, which I got called a lot. Uh, but uh, popular culture helps, Instagram helps. Putting a post of an older car, even if it's an old 84, old Maruti 800, it helps because it looks cool on your Instagram. A lot of people today, sadly, live on social media as their first point of contact. Stuff like this helps them. An old classic Mercedes does wonders for uh, social media. So that helps, it's popular culture. Yeah, that's right. It's like a popular movement. You, uh, with uh, you, Bhiram, has there anything, like any interesting stories around? Do actually get a lot of uh, attention. And uh, any questions with the audience? Yes, yes. Do we, uh, okay, why don't we open us and uh, why don't you ask questions to gentlemen and here and uh, have your deeper understanding on the subject. Questions? Someone must have a question. Can you import the old cars? Is it allowed to import cars, uh, the antique cars? Well, uh, the general uh, open category of import is for cars made before 1st of January 1950. So you can. But uh, there are other categories which are restrictive categories under which you can import cars. But this is the only open category. And uh, we are all wishing and hoping that uh, they see the day to maybe 1960 or. Yeah. Well, that's really hopeful. But the idea is that really they should say cars because they don't want to open the import of cars. Because uh, they don't want to create competition for the foreign companies that are pouring lots of money into setting up operations in India. So if they say that you can import cars, maybe. 30 years ago or more, that's fine. And every year it just it remains 30 years, and that's it. They should do that, but they haven't. Yeah, I understand there's a lot of jugad here uh, in India, which is available to restore the old cars, it's, you know, in Indore and other places. So do you think it would become like a hub? India could become like a hub for restoring old cars. Um, yes, uh, I'll tell you in the past there have been people who sent cars down, a couple of uh, Jensen interceptors are sent down for restoration, there have been various uh, components that have been sent down for Jaguar parts, etc., long members, things that have to be manufactured here. Uh, wheels are made in India and sent abroad for historical cars. Uh, Yes, it's possible. Uh, today, our restoration standards, at least in certain quarters, are no, not second to anywhere in the world. Uh, and that's despite the fact that we have a lack of availability of, uh, of uh, knowledge on tap.
for specific vehicles as well as components. But fortunately, most of the uh, the high value uh, classic cars are owned by people obviously who can afford to import parts, and they do that. So our levels of restoration are very good. Whether we will eventually become a hub, I'm not sure. Labor is definitely cheap and it's labor intensive work. Uh, it's just the freight to and fro and our restrictive customs procedures that would probably not make it a very successful business venture. Thank you. Just to add, uh, the official replica for the Benz patent trial is also made in India. Uh, the car doesn't exist originally anyway, even the Mustis Museum car is, is a replica. The official car that you can buy for a set amount of money if you want one is actually made here in India and it's imported globally. I don't know if it's still made, but it's still it is in India. Yeah. So, and it's a brilliant, brilliant, 100% thank you. Almost. I'd just like to <coughs> add like to uh, take that a little further about the Jogana part. Uh, it's exactly because of this great Jogana culture that we have in India that I think our classic car movement, you know, is better place than in the West. Because in the West, one of the, I think, main reasons why youngsters are not in this uh, passion in the classic car culture is because it is extremely expensive to maintain these cars over there, whether it is insurance, or it is the cost of restoring one of these cars because uh, their, their charges, is, everything is by the hour. Whereas over here, you can take it to a reasonably good workshop and they do reasonably good work. Uh, prices, you know, manual labor. Labor is a plenty over here still and uh, costs are low. Therefore, I think this uh, Jogada culture that we have in India is vital for the classic car movement to stay with the youth. It's one of the driving factors. It actually works in our favor. Yes. You mentioned uh, about how Rolls Royce and Bentley's are the top of mind. You're mentioning how the awareness is uh, really lacking at this point of time and people need to know more about the historical vehicles and what they have as layman's, just one or two brand names. So would you like to add, because you were mentioning a couple of them which uh, we didn't have the history about. You see, what happened in, what happened in India was that uh, most of the really good brands Marks like say Hispano Suiza, Soto Franchini, Nelaya, Nelaj, and so on. Most of them vanished from here. Foreigners took them out before the ban came in. Now, uh, there is a general perception. See, first of all, Indians were not interested in old cars. I gave you the example okay, my aunt and uncle's Jaguar Mark 7, perfectly in top condition, went at 6,000 rupees in 1982 in Jorbaya because there were no buyers for the car. So, but that was the market. I think your Jaguar Mark 7 also went. Hmm? 2006. Okay, whatever. So, there was no market for these cars. Now, what happened was that the foreigners knew, okay, the Rolls, Roy Rolls Royces and Bentleys, barring a few which were exceptional for whatever reason, for coach work or whatever, were not the really valuable cars. The valuable cars were the exotic marks which most of them no longer exist and they took them out. Now in India, you see the general public uh, did not really have exposure to these kinds of cars. So after, after independence, I remember when we were in school, uh, you know, the Chevrolet, Impala, and the Mercedes-Benz were considered very good marks. Uh, because those were the marks people were exposed to after independence. And then, of course, people always knew Rolls Royce and Bentley. But most people don't realize that the Rolls Royce in Bentley is not really all that valuable. Why is sure. a few? Yeah. It's the other marks. Right. And that awareness I don't think is still there. So do we see this? Uh, so we, we all are in consensus of saying that we see the youth carrying this forward. That is for sure happening. And what pace is it happening or is going to happen, that we don't know. But we see that in happening, right? So it's in, it's in the future is in good hands. But all we have to do is we have to get together to make it, keep it as a more responsible thing as a community, as getting all together, as as united as we all can to preserve that history here. 
Anything uh, you wanted to ask? All right. So yeah. Um, so autonomous, uh, as we all say towards the end, uh, we, we kind of uh, br brief it up right now, we'll wind it up, saying that what is it that one thing that you would want to uh, keep continuing, one, and would want to suggest to the youngsters of today to uh, for the historical vehicles uh, in the subject? Well, as long as there are enthusiasts, old enthusiasts like myself around, uh, who uh, encourage it and you know, you've got these cars going on, you're going to have youngsters coming. On Sunday mornings, we have youngsters coming. They come with cameras, they photograph the cars, they ask questions, they come for rides with us. So since we have people like that, uh, as long as we keep the movement going, the youngsters will follow and there'll be a time when they take over and the movement is in completely safe hands. The only thing is valid point that you made was that abroad for restoration you have very expensive hourly rates. So youngsters don't want to get into it. And in India it's much cheaper to go to your local garage. However, abroad they have a DIY system where youngsters pick up a project car and they try to restore it themselves. They work on it and they work so many hours and sometimes they so many years for them to just get uh, you know a car on the road. Like, like a Morris Minor for example, anything like that. So I would like that culture to come to India. Um, I wouldn't want people, do not want to get their hands dirty. Because when they start working on the car themselves, they will understand the car better. It's like building a relationship with a human being. You build it with the car. You, you understand each other much better. And you've gone through the process, you know. And that will, that will make the movement go stronger and stronger and stronger. Thank you very much for uh, some wonderful insights. Uh, you know, these are short events and they can only achieve so much, but it's good to see three or four different um, value systems and perspectives and ideologies. And the key is that unity, the individuality, at the same time the institutionalization of the process, because without that the journey is not sustainable. You can't bring people together. You have to find events which, you know, imagine this simple event. Seven cars, four experts, uh, enthusiasts, an auction, a preview, memorabilia, so many other pieces of the jigsaw come together. And you need every day pieces of those jigsaw coming together. So thank you all very, very much. And let us move on to the next event. Thank you. Thank you so much. He was somebody who was into rally driving. 
and I must have been eight or nine years then, and I, I felt, I remember feeling like he was the coolest uh, gentleman on the planet. And uh, I remember uh, he used to take us, we were about five, six kids, and he used to take us in his open jeep. And he used to go to this empty plot of land. Not, not very recommended, but he would go to this empty plot of land and drive really fast and pull the handbrake. And the car would do these like spins and we used to feel like, wow, this is now heaven and this is the coolest guy in the world. Uh, so, I mean, that is the earliest memory I have of, uh, you know, uh, somebody who used to drive a rally car and doing all these cool things in his Jeep. And uh, around eight, nine years back, uh, a friend of mine actually owns, in, owns a, a garage and he's into uh, restoring old cars. Uh, so I spent a lot of time with him uh, because we're both passionate about cars. And he actually recommended this uh, rally driving school outside Bombay, uh, which was close to Karjat, which was uh, run by this gentleman called Pradeep. And uh, uh, it was a very, very cool place. It was, uh, it was a place which had a track. It had uh, obstacles. Uh, it had a bit of a mountain that he had built. Uh, it had, uh, uh, you know, the water pit. Uh, so I used to go there on the weekends and I used to train with him. And it was incredibly good fun. Unfortunately, I don't think it was sustainable for very long. And he had to shut it down. But uh, I spent a fair amount of time there with him. And uh, uh, three years back, uh, uh, I obviously had not had enough and I have not had enough. Uh, so I went to Abu Dhabi where they have the Formula One circuit. And they also have this uh, Formula One three uh, training circuit, which is when the circuit shut. Uh, they have trainers that uh, help you, uh, you know, put you in the Formula 3 car and uh, take you around the circuit and then they leave you loose. This uh, is the Renault, Renault engine ones, is no, it? No, this, this is not the Renault engine ones. The Ford. Sorry? The Ford, I think Ford. I think they're the Ford ones, ones. yeah. Ford. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, uh, that was something that completely blew my mind and that's something that I'd like to go back to and do more often. Uh, I was there for about four days. Uh, but that four days, my God, it was just amazing fun. And um, uh, yeah, it just, uh, it just, uh, just the feeling of being in that car with that helmet, small little car, driving at that speed. Uh, I don't think anything comes close to that. In that case, now getting to the topic of the fact that before this, you know, we had all the people who were what you were talking about. In fact, the future, right. the aspect of autonomous cars. The fact right. that soon you will have travelers vehicles. Right. What happens? Where, where, which way does, which way is motorsport going? Well, you know, uh, uh, the thing with technology is that uh, I also own a tech company. I started a tech company about six years back. And the thing with technology is that we believe that technology will come and replace jobs, and we feel like technology will come and change the lives that we have. I don't think that's true. In fact, uh, I believe that technology actually takes away the jobs that a lot of people don't want to do and actually leaves us more time and more space to do things that we want to do. So you, instead of four days, you're going to get 40 days being able to do your F3? Yeah, possibly, yes. Yeah. As long as they don't have uh, robots that start acting, I think I'm fine with that. So have you been following motorsport in India, specifically? In India? You know, honestly, uh, not so much. Uh, I uh, haven't had a chance to follow it very, very closely. Uh, which is obviously all the rally car driving and stuff. But no, I haven't had a chance to follow it very closely now. And uh, you, did you go for any of those F1 events, uh, the ones in Delhi? The I went for the one in Delhi. And it was, it was very unfortunate that it's not continued anymore. Which is the point I'm coming to. Right. So which way, you know, which way is Indian motorsport going, given the fact that there was a situation where we had finally, we were hosting an F1 right. race, and then three right. years down the line, we had to shut it down. You know, before that, I would actually like to pick your brains about the history of Indian motorsport. Oh, instead. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll get to the future later. I think we should go into the past. And, uh, you know, I, I just feel like we have had a, a tradition of motorsport racing in this country. Yeah. That's a very true. long tradition. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think many people know about the tradition. I think it's just a very sort of niche, uh, you know, uh, part of the population that really sort of understand that we have this long yeah, history. We have had a long history. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so given that we've had this long history, where do you think you see, I mean, right now, what, what do you think the level of motorsport and rally racing is in this country right now? Right now, okay. Uh, just historically, it's interesting to, I think, point out that the first uh, event that was in India was a reliability trial, what do you call it, just a reliability, not a flat out race. It's a question of how long the car could survive. Those days, it's a question of how long the car could, how far could we go with the car? was in 1904, 
from Calcutta to Barakpo. And of course, they had to stop for tea and all that. The English were at it, so it's a different situation. So we'll go to back to the letter. Um, there seems to obviously have been some kind of reliability trials in those early days. And then after independence, from late 40s onwards, from around 1948, when the Calcutta Motorsport Club started officially actually organizing events in and around Calcutta, and then it came to Sholabram to Ju in the 50s, uh, where they were racing. There was racing in Sholabram, which is near Chennai, near Madras. And then there was racing also in Pune and in Bangalore. India had quite an amazing and very active motorsports racing scene from the 50s, 60s. And by the 70s, this racing had become less so, but had moved to rally, to the point when we had the Himalayan rally in the 80s, which at the first Himalayan rally brought some of the finest drivers in the world. Shikram Mehta, who was one of the greatest rally drivers of all time, of Indian origin, he's not an Indian, he was a Kenyan, had, had rallied in the first time. So we had quite an amazing history. And then something went, it kind of disappeared. There was all these internecine problems and issues. With Formula One and F1 it coming to uh, Booth Circuit in Delhi, it came back, and then it's out again become history. The current situation, I think we're back to again as a here, there kind of a thing. So, so that's the point is okay, what do we do? How do we take motorsport back to being at the forefront? What, is, what do you think? What are the possibilities? What are the solutions? Well, I, I think, you know, from uh, everything that I know, I think first and foremost, of course, we need more government support. Uh, I think, uh, I don't think it's still recognized as a sport. No, which that is, was the whole problem. Uh, and uh, so I think first and foremost, I think government support is essential. And I think it's very important that people that are into the sport and enjoy the sport, I think maybe uh, get together and you know, approach the government, make a proposal. I'm sure that's been done. Uh, but I think it's very important to pursue that because I think first and foremost, the government has to give it the, the stature that it deserves. Uh, I think that's that's the only way that it's going to uh, change. Secondly, I think uh, there is a, a perception, and rightly so, is that it's a it's a rich man spot. Uh, it's a very expensive spot, and you need a fancy car to make it possible. Uh, but what I believe is that what is changing is that there's a lot of go kart go karting races that are happening, and uh, uh, these go karting races, winners of these go karting races, are actually getting sponsorships and stuff. So I think that's a good way to go. Uh, I think it's very important to encourage it at a grassroots level uh, and start at a place where it's not very expensive uh, so that you can sort out and get the right talent uh, coming out of that. I think that is really important. In that case, the other point I would like to come up with is the kind of bring in is something that Cyrus pointed out, Cyrus Khan, in the earlier talk, was about uh, popular culture, about being able to take something like this to the popular, to the masses, right. where cinema, he mentioned about, of course, Fast and Furious in the context of the of Hollywood and the global situation. Where do you think and what can Bollywood do about it? I know that Bollywood has done sometimes things at some point. What can Bollywood do about it today? Can it? Well, you know, there are uh, uh, strangely, I mean, there are a bunch of films. Uh, actually, two films that we made. I've been approached for one of them, which is around car racing, which I think is a good beginning. Yes. Uh, because, like you're saying, uh, Bollywood is uh, is something that sort of else uh, things reach out far more than anything else can. So I think that is the beginning. But I don't know if uh, that, in, that in itself is enough, uh, because uh, unless it becomes really part of, like when you look at Formula 1 and 2 and 3 and uh, motorsport out west, uh, there's just so much interest and there's so much awareness about it. So when you have a film that comes out, uh, there's a lot of enthusiasts that go to watch that film. Right now, I think uh, within our country, it's still, like I said, it's niche and it's limited to a certain amount of people. Uh, so I don't know how uh, how much it'll be able to reach out to the masses uh, just through a film. I just think there's lots, lots more that needs to be done. At the grassroots level. Right. Now, in terms of grassroots level, would you have some, what are the kind of suggestions? In terms of, of course, karting is, as you said, one of the most accessible sport. But even for um, the fact that karting at the, at the end of the day is something that's close to essentially urban centers, big cities. I guess it doesn't go to the rural areas at all, to the, where still the majority of where Indians live. Right. What is it that we can take probably to the rural areas? Rallying also is, it becomes a more expensive sport. So what could it be that could be done that can bring in people and you know 
Well, honestly, I, I'm not the expert, but I don't think we should be targeting the rural areas right now. Okay. Because I just feel like there's still so much in the urban areas that's left to explore. And there's so many people that you can reach out to, even in the urban areas. I think the rural areas should be step two. Uh, I think first and foremost, we should uh, look at making it more popular within the urban centers. I think uh, that should be the approach. In terms of, we also try to connect with historical vehicles. You know, we've been talking about motorsport, of course, and that's what you're into, modern motorsport, right? F3, right? Um, okay, before historical, let's first talk about electric, right. Formula E. Yeah. Where do you see Formula E versus Formula 1? Or for the matter, the future motorsport in terms of electric? Well, you know, I, I don't think uh, it's, it's going to ever replace Formula 1. But I think there's a place for, for both. Uh, uh, you know, when you look at the electric cars nowadays, they, I think right now it's the, the fastest cars at about 230 kilometers per hour, which is fast, very fast. And I think when the batteries become lighter and, uh, you know, uh, become slightly more powerful, then you're going to see them almost competing with the Formula 1 cars. So I think it's, it's great. I, I think it's wonderful because, uh, you know, there is a lot of talk always about how Formula 1 is wasteful and it's not very good for the environment. And uh, you know you hear a lot of people talking about that. Uh, so I, I think this is a good alternate. I think it's a great alternate, but I don't think uh, we're going to see it replacing Formula One anytime soon. I don't think that's something that's going to happen. And, and the plan to take Formula One to 20 races right. is that too much? No, I think that's good. I enjoy it. I mean, the more the merrier. The more the merrier. <laughs> Coming back to connecting it with historical vehicles, the fact that uh, you've seen the cars which have lined up outside. And there's a lot of historic racing. In fact, if at all, the, there are bigger events which are almost historic events. The Million Miglia, the Le Mans Classic, the Good Wood Racing. Right. Have you been following any of that? Is that of interest to you or you feel that they're two different worlds? Well, I, I, I think there's, there are two different worlds. I mean, I, I like vintage cars a lot, of course. I, I enjoy them and I like seeing them. And it's like you said, it's a part of history. Uh, I'm not so sure I enjoy watching them race, though. I see. Uh, uh, I think uh, I think also I mean from from the young people that I've spoken to, uh, they they believe that uh, that it is uh, it is something which is the rich man's gentleman we know very well, Mr. Nazir Hussain, who is in keeping to well. Unfortunately, at the same time, there is an extraordinary history that needs to be told and re re related, recorded, and put out. Because the Himalayan Rally was at one time a contender for world championship. Sadly, politics and what have you destroyed that. We again have Formula One coming in. There's something more, there's something very sad that we keep getting things. We keep getting to the top level. We, we, with Himalayan Rally, we got to the top level of the rallying situation and something went wrong. Formula One, with Bull Circuit, we got to the top level. Four years down the line, we had to shut it down. Rodeo Trophy for motorcycle enthusiasts. We had the World Championship in Pune for about three years before they lost it. I don't know what's the problem. Why is it that we get to the top and then we lose it? We haven't got to the top. We are getting to the point where oh, we get it's to... not working and that work doesn't get sustained or institutional. Exactly. So we probably just get... So why? But well, why? Yeah. Maybe, I don't know, if so somebody else has an answer. Maybe we could also have the answer. Or maybe we could have the answer for that. Politics. Politics, as in politics. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like we were talking about, there's no government support too. And that's been the history of motorsport, you know, like you read. Exactly. Yeah. There's one thing that I would like to add, brother, about grassroots motorsport development. So what the Federation is doing now is that, you know, in the 25, 30 years ago, we had the Jim Khanna, and that's coming back now. So India is now doing the Jim Khanna National Championship coming next year. And this year we also had the Asia Auto Jim Khanna competition being organized by in India by our club under the aegis of the FMSCI of course. That's grassroots development of motorsport. So Kunal, you know, you came and you flagged off the women's uh car in the women's right. So what you should do is the next time you do this and next year, put yourself in a car. Yeah. Okay, and come follow the Jim Khanna. It's, it's it's amazing. The track is 40 seconds, you come, take part, you know, and there are knockouts. So it's really an amazing way of bringing motorsport down to the grassroots level so that people in their regular cars can participate. So we hope that this will now pick up, you know, the cross car and rally cross and, you know, all of those. 
So hopefully that may change and you know, we'll get back more support to the masses. Right. That is, you know, I was actually going to say something similar to what you're saying is that I, I think it might be interesting to get people that are popular uh, to uh, participate in these because I, I know there's a lot of people that are racing enthusiasts uh, like me. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you get people that are popular to, to talk about this and so uh, you, you know, make so you, have to, you, have to, you have to take the lead. I am very, I'm very, happy, to take the lead. <laughs> I'm very happy to take the lead at this. Uh, but I'm saying if we get, we get more people involved, and I would not, I mean, I'm very happy to reach out to more people to make sure that they get involved. Uh, I, I think that would at least be some sort of beginning, and that's some sort of way of popularizing the sport. So yeah, it's, it's great, and it's not a rich man's sport. Then. All you need is a regular car. Yeah. So, Shri, now you are the brand ambassador for the There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm keeping in touch with you. <laughs> like there was a, I, I, who was saying, I, I, I'm not sure who said that, but it was one of the Indian Formula One drivers. He said, if you grow up in India driving cars, you're already halfway trained <laughs> to, drive, to drive race cars because you have to, you know, sort of traffic. circumvent all the traffic. So if, if you're driving in India anyway, everyone's half trained. Cyrus? Can I ask a bit of a question? Uh, you Maybe with the exception of Coimbatore, which I don't know much about, but Delhi for sure, and Jeddah to an extent now has open track days. You come once a month, and it's not very really expensive. It's 9,000 bucks a session for a half an hour session to come and drive on a grade A track with uh, safety feature that are and part of any Formula One circuit in the world. And uh, the movement of people in Delhi, the number of sheer bikers and car guys who come, who are now building track cars for that event every month and improving them every month and getting faster and faster. The number of people who come from Bombay, for example, the, the whole supercar crew from Bombay gets into two trucks and well, 15 cars this time last month. Uh, I think that's very important. So the whole concept of track day is now developing. Of course, I believe we've got a new track coming out very close to where we are sitting now, uh, geographically. So that will also help because we've never had that around Bombay. And Bombay, honestly, is just somewhere between Bombay and Pune. Honestly, Bombay is, I mean, as much as the South loves to claim their dominance in the uh, motorsport field and the enthusiast field, it isn't. It's the Bombay guys who are today the most enthusiastic about driving their cars and coming out every weekend and having these smaller clubs form. So having a track here would just be very good for all of us. And it wouldn't be, I don't know, if if you've seen the the video that's been doing the WhatsApp rounds of uh, Lodge Clyde of Newburgh uh, track day where half the cars are getting smashed up. It's, you have, it's not been like that as yet, no. That's quite exciting footage. And that could have It's safe. It's safe. At the end, it's safe. Exactly. It's safe. So, so the thing I find really fascinating, which, uh, which I know a few friends that are into, is now virtual racing. Uh, and now there's a championship, of course, and uh, people are participating. And what, what's exciting about virtual racing is that there's uh, there's some really experienced drivers that are now being paid to, to race in the virtual racing circuits. Uh, so I think that is exciting. That that is something that can actually help uh, the sport to reach out uh, because you know it really you can you can either obviously get the, the full kit and get the whole car and at the simulator and all that, but you can also actually do it in a much cheaper way as well if you get a nice steering wheel and nice sort of uh, uh, set up to hook it up, uh, which is not very expensive. I, I think uh, that is something that can help reach out, you know. Who won it? Ah, right, Nissan has the GT Academy, yeah. And in fact, at the GT Academy, there are people that are just gamers that are coming in, being given a chance to, yeah. Which is, which is great. Um, some more questions, points, another interesting inputs. Just wanted to also add here when you said that it's a sport of rich men, basically, Kunal and Gautam. So, uh, 2005, when I rallied for the first time in Himalayan Rally, Reddy Himalayan Rally, there were not too many women there that time. It was just one or two, probably. Uh, now we see, we have recently come up with this Commission of Women in Motorsports and FMSCI. We are also promoting women now. So just to say that, uh, like how uh, Bollywood can be a little more attractive for uh, 
whatever. And so women can also give a lot of more stories about women and driving together. So about series or television, maybe we can not just, it's not just about a commercial film, it's about like a Netflix series or a virtual, as you said, like a reality show, like you have Big Boss, you have behind the scenes of what is happening with the, with the racers, with the rally drivers, and how day one goes, day two goes. So a lot is happening. It's just that uh, we all need to come together, and as, uh, as it was for the historical breakers, we all need to unite together to get to that point of breaking that and making it as a sport acknowledged. But it is not a Richmond sport right now because it's been auditioned. So this time, for the first time, we literally auditioned. Like you have singing competition, you have dance competitions, you have acting competition. We literally had a driving competition. Audition. So who, who, uh, who sort of sponsored the cars and all that for those? Uh... So, so there are different tire companies, there are manufacturers, car manufacturers who are supporting it, you know. But uh, all FMSCI can do is organize it. But we need to have other corporate sponsors as well, you know. So right now we did it with JK and uh, so JK has been supporting it. And uh, they've auditioned 60 out of 6 and the top 6 girls are there, now they're racing with them. So they have taken the responsibility of training them. So why, why, why don't you, uh, I would be happy to help with a show like that actually, yeah, which is about the auditions and which is about it. the thing and you know it's about a driver coming through, maybe a driver winning, uh, you know, so uh, I think that would be an interesting show to do and it doesn't, uh, maybe, maybe it's not something that you can, I don't know if there's enough content to create for like a Netflix, but uh, there, there is uh, enough content that can be created for something like that. So I, I think that, that might be an interesting way to go, which is uh, the next time you have the auditions, you know, maybe we, we can connect a couple of months much earlier than that. And uh, we can figure out a way of uh, actually shooting those and making a show out of that. I think that would be interesting. Because actually human minds like when you're driving this full balance that they can capture. Incidentally, that you, about, that's of course the topic by itself, women and motorsport, which we are talking, we are done a few years ago. Where I think the interesting point, which we had Michelle Muto, who was uh, almost world champion in rallying, so probably the, the highest level any woman ever got to motorsport. She had an interesting point to say about, and she still fights though, and she's part of FIA, FIA. She heads the Women's Commission and she insists that this is the one sport where you don't differentiate between men and women. Yeah. Everyone's equal. And at the end of the day, she would prefer to keep that. Of course, not to discourage, but at the same time, I know Hasha, don't make those gestures, but <laughs> <laughs> they should be treated as equal. So that's, that's a different point, of course. Uh, coming to, uh, Cyrus had mentioned something earlier about popular culture. Everyone here um, seems to still not get in the answer of why I've organized this. You know, the whole point of, um, first of all, remember, for 25 years, we've never taken one rupee of sponsorship. So I think sponsorship is a total uh, irrelevancy, uh, especially for anything that needs to be done in a systematic, sustainable manner with a vision. Secondly, the nature of popular culture that is existing in India and the kind of solutions that uh, we are recommended is nothing but dumbing down, bringing it to some kind of instantaneous thrill, destroying the whole idea of why we are trying to do this. So in the last two and a half hours, I've not had one original idea that's come out of this symposium, which has given me even the slightest um, additional thought of how are you going to respect and build an automatic automotive culture in which we respect it, a certain understanding of history, understanding of the mind, the mind that, that created those cars, how are they relevant today? What's the link between the past, the present, and the future which is sustainable? How do we integrate it into an educational framework, into daily curricula? How do we slowly transform that kind of energy into a different set of values in which your history and your traditions start identifying with your sense of identity. Slowly privileging culture, the values that a creative culture stands for, whether it's risk-taking, whether it's innovation, whether it's a love for creativity, whether it's a compassion to absorb everything, 
None of that. In three hours. Nevin, that's what you have brought out is about 300 topics that for the next 300 days we should be yeah, discussing and debating. The whole point is the in, point three hours, is, in three exactly. hours, even if I had heard one sentence, the only person, this lady in front of me and with me, uh, were the only two who were uh, moving in that direction. But the whole point is that uh, it's so easy to make it spectacular and entertaining. That's not the nature of awareness building. Yes, we compromise. We bring celebrities, we bring people from the Indian cinema. Obviously, Kunal has an enthusiasm, a love, an interest. He's there, supported. But everything in this country seems to come down to bringing in celebrity to create an awareness, therefore to generate a kind of interest, therefore to bring in sponsors, therefore to make a big event, therefore to try to reach out and therefore bring in all. It's failing. It's an abysmal failure. This country is going down and down and down in all these journeys. That's why we are nowhere to the answer. Why did we destroy our Formula One possibilities, our rallying possibilities? Where there's no research. Not one world-class designer, one, not, not one damn we, um, you know, world-class scientific innovation. Yes, and yet we have reached cars before anyone else. So there is something fundamentally wrong in the way in which education, vocations, training, a whole host of things are working together. And it's not the government's fault. It's not, it's our fault. Each of us, each of us, and there's so many, there's at least, I can see 25 times with great dedication, given 40, 50 years of their life to this subject. Um, each of them, in any other country, would be leaders in doing so much more in building an infrastructure, in taking forward this. And yet here, that doesn't get nurtured. That's the key. Why doesn't it get nurtured? Why does it slowly die as come dead? And you know, I, I'll keep on with it tonight. I have done this is maybe the 350th event in 25 years. Sometimes two people come. Yeah, yes. But the point is, it has to continue. And it, I think Rebecca has a point. Yeah. Yes, it's what you're well, That was very passionate. Uh, I agree with you. One of my points actually was this that motorsport always is, is sort of seen from the driver's uh, point of view, and therefore, you know, it's the rich man, and of course, in India, no politician wants to. Uh, throw their weight behind, so obviously behind a rich, um, you know, kind of pursuit. But the fact is there's a whole other ecosystem required to keep this going, which is a whole raft of engineers, you know, enthusiasts at that level. Now, if this were actually introduced at that level in terms of uh, in colleges, or if you have uh, our motorsport clubs or the um, heritage vehicle clubs, they actually have these, these sessions, workshops, where you call engineering uh, groups to come and work, or either tear down a car, rebuild it, uh, help to restore it, you actually understand what has gone into it, and you actually talk about you know the culture of how that that vehicle came to be. So you can actually cultivate a whole a whole lot of engineers into this whole thing of motorsport and perfection and racing. That's where you get a push from the bottom. Instead of just, you know, uh, in terms of motorsport and the glamour and that that entire view, you you have uh, you, you you make it actually more popular. So it becomes more of uh, excellence in engineering. How how much better can you do? Because it's also that. Um, I just think that's a better a good way to go. Start liaisoning with engineering colleges. That's yeah. yeah. So there is an order of the classroom lesson that has been going on for the last 12 years in this country. I organized the Baha I say India. That's the Baha, the Baha I say India, as well as the, the Indian version of the former I say the Society of Automotive Engineers. So it's out of the classroom learning. Uh, all the students in the third to fourth years assisted also by all the students in the second and first years. Come and build the vehicles according to the specifications that we give and we evaluate them. And quite a few of, I mean, not quite, a, quite a few of the students have been picked up by our motor industry and also in more sports. So that's happening. And you know about the engineering students and the sessions. We've been having training sessions for the last 10 years for these students all across the country. We started with one Baha, which is there in North, in Kutumbu, in Willow County. 
we do another one in uh, Chandigarh, which is with uh, IIT Roper. And uh, going ahead, we hope that we will go to the other IITs also. So, and we host about 5,000 students at every event. That's so much more. Mm -hmm. And also for classic cards, I mean, not only for racing, but uh, understanding values. Sure. Comes sure. So, you know, as Benham was saying in the past session, it passes on from generation. And that's one entry. And then, of course, we do take our cars out, and there are a lot of kids and youngsters who come in. And, uh, you know, the example that he gave, I think, was just so apt that the youngsters come in and then, you know, move on to probably acquiring class cars of their own. So, I think uh, it's all good. And so how, do you, how do you get, like, uh, how do you get, like, younger people to get, like, educated about the cars? Like, NT was saying is that how do you like sort of introduce them to what what all is gone into building that car, the history of off motorsport and you know what goes into. So so there are two things, right? If you're talking about classic cars, you know, then it's only the classic car owners, you know, who would bring their cars out more often and make them more visible, you know, and uh, and then of course they being visible and then spreading awareness. That is one. The other thing is for those who are mechanically inclined, you know, that's where the engineering way is going. So uh, these are the ways that I see it, uh, you know, happening. Besides that, I don't know how uh, I mean, youngsters would look at it. Uh, it's just true. I was eight years old. I remember going to the police gym car, or the Islam gym car, and there were vintage car fiestas. There were vintage car fiestas at Marine Drive. So I've we may say been involved in classic cars since the age of eight years. I drove the national uh, Indian National Rally Championship uh, when I was 18, and uh, but that you know you, you can't get somebody to do it. It has to be there, and it's all in, in you, like at eight years old, who, who would uh, bother to go and watch. But like my dad took me there, and uh, and so then we followed Stolbers, like his father, like Mr. Nazir Hussain, and then and how many people in the room really know who Nazir is? And how many people really took advantage of the guy? Yeah? One of the greatest men in motorsport history, the greatest Indian, and like how many people in the room really took advantage? I don't know if you have a question. I was at Liberty for two years. But um, anyways, uh, wonderful. Uh, I'm not talking about Sakhi from the global perspective because uh, uh, as a part of FIBA, which I have part of, um, which is the International Federation for uh, Historic Vehicles. Uh, it's predominantly historic vehicle of so the whole culture, the automotive culture, they're very bothered about the culture because that's what we are hooking up with UNESCO to recognize it as part of human of, of human heritage, mobile heritage as we describe it. Now the aspect of automotive culture is of course traditionally it's been Europe and North America. Right? Asia has really not been part of the culture. And today if you really look at it, of course, Japan has had an industry, and so it has some culture. Uh, but leaving out Japan, and even more than Japan, India has an incredible history and automotive culture. It's probably the only country in all of Asia that has quite an automotive culture and history, which is there. Of course, it's at the end of the day only for a very select set of people, and it hasn't necessarily been taken by the masses. And that's where I think our job or our, you know, that's where we need to take it across to a wider audience. Wider because audience. the masses, Gotham has integrated it into some intellectual discourse, which is a daily discourse on many levels. It's about integrating, you know, how do you integrate anything which becomes part of your daily thinking process? That we, we've not shared the industrial journey of the Western automobile, obviously, but therefore we have to bring another kind of uh, journey. And that requires thinking, particularly for our needs. And, but that's a journey that's all of us will do. You know, I'm sure we all have to do it so much and we all will try to do more. And we must uh, move on tonight. And really thank you very, very much, everyone. You know, the wonderful cars outside, uh, the, the really great joy. And I wish you know, I should have I made a fundamental mistake of not bringing the, um, the public, uh, because this is a kind of building where you can't just bring people um, the hundreds have come, but we should have had thousands of just normal people coming out of church gate station, redirecting them here um, with paid 10 police officers in the same way Bayram got his police officer. We needed to find that same police officer today. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, it will go through the media and 
So the collection, the collectors, the vehicle, the panel discussion, thank you all of the discussions, um, some wonderful thoughts, the energy, Gautam, Kunal, thank you very much for um, your love and energy and being here and sharing your thoughts. Um, after this is food and drink, um, the exhibition opens, and um, just enjoy yourselves. Thank you everyone. Uh, Mr. Gamadia, you want to say something? <laughs> I think we have discussed this in 2015 also in Liberty. Yes, remember that. What he said is that although we have an automotive culture, it's restricted to a very few people. You see, before independence, it was the Maharajas and the landed elite and so on and so forth. At the same time, let's say in England, Mr. Yeah, Smith. Well, I mean, not necessarily the <laughs> Too many of them around. <laughs> They are saying, okay, forget the tiger, save the park city. <laughs> anyway, you, you see at the same time, in England, Mr. Smith could afford an Austin 7. Where, whereas here it was not possible. You see, an average Joe's could still not afford an Austin 7. So there was an automotive culture which in those countries, in the Western countries like, say, England and America and Europe built up. If you look at England today, every month, virtually or every week, some village or the other in England has some show or the other, a local show where people bring cars. There are nothing like that here. He mentioned today, for example, that uh, uh, there were shows on the marine track Gymkhanas in the 90s. I remember that. See, today what do you have? You have one bloody show in the whole year, that BCCI thing in uh, March, and uh, March or January or whenever it is, and it will usually coincide with the Derby so that nobody else will come. And, so you have to start, but there in those countries, people already had an automotive culture from the daily use cars, like say Singers, Hillmans, Austins, and so they could appreciate the higher marks. See, here we don't have that. But um, um, I'll say something which is relevant. Um, 25 years now, um, come January, it's my 25th anniversary of struggle. Um, we opened finally the research center, archive, library, and sanctuary to the public. It's a lovely space in about 12 and a half acres in Delhi. And you will have, on a daily basis, 24 7, uh, it's the world's greatest knowledge base on India's culture of the last 200 years. And you will therefore have events, daily events, in which automotive culture, the history of all facets of the automobile, Vintage, classic, and all other kinds will be integrated, linked to the fine arts, linked to cinema, linked to photography, design, all facets of popular culture. With the finest minds from all over the world being there. So we'll do as much as we can, and um, the rest we all will do whenever we can. It's a great idea. I mean, uh, first of all, I think it's a great idea to get so many motorsport enthusiasts together uh, to discuss, uh, like uh, we were talking about, the history of the sport in the country. Uh, the fact that we have such a long history of motorsport in this country and very few people know about it. And also to, uh, to talk about where we are presently and how we can, we can popularize the sport 
uh, far more than it has been popularized? How do we make sure that this sport reaches out to far more people than it does right now? Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, there there's has to be a way of translating this long history that we've had uh, into the future as well. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a great platform. I mean, hats off to Ocean for, Ocean for bringing, this to, bringing so many people together. And also, uh, like you said, uh, introducing it in the whole uh, format of art, uh, which is very, very important uh, to get it to reach out to people again. Yeah, because what we are trying to kind of at least say that this is part of the last 200 years, uh, a very important part of human, let's say, civilization. Right. Yeah. Of you know, obviously, as an actor, you know, I can speak at platforms like this about how much I feel about the sport mm -hmm. and how passionate I am about the sport. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are popular you know, celebrities that would like to talk about this work, uh, people that really enjoy motorsport. But uh, I don't know if that's enough. I think that's just one part of it. But uh, like we were saying is that if you want to popularize the sport, if you wanted to reach out to more people, if you want people to get involved into the history of uh, motorsport automobile in India, then it really has to be introduced uh, in schools, colleges, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and at a more grassroot, sort of grassroots level, yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me a little about your experience with that and how do you find today? What do you think will integrate into that? Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, these are these are such beautiful cars, and I I just I wish there were more events like this. I wish there was uh, you know, more people that came out with their cars, uh, you know, to showcase them to show people. Uh, we were also talking about how it would be wonderful to have people understand the engineering of these old cars, uh, you know, these vintage cars. Uh, so I, I think it's very important that the owners of these cars uh, don't keep it, don't keep the cars to themselves and, you know, are more willing to sort of showcase these cars. Also the history of the car and what went into it. So I think the more we do uh, that, uh, the more we will be able to reach out to people and, you know, garner interest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Visual market will be the second by थोड़ा सा पीछे आना पड़ेगा पीछे पीछे अब लोग पीछे और पीछे आ जाओ ना
यहाँ पे भी लेना है क्या Um, this is the first uh, preview in India for Automobilia, uh, basically which is about all the art and culture which surrounds the automobile. Um, without that, you can't create a kind of automotive culture. Uh, all the paintings, the prints, the photographs, the maps, the drawings, the design work, the film stills, all these kind of objects which are part of our history, part of our culture, but don't get the respect. And most important, they are not part of daily life. They're not used in our education systems. They're not used in our knowledge base. Um, India, by and large, doesn't understand how to read the image. It just looks at text and words. And as a result, we are not putting it in our schools and colleges in an effective way. So uh, auction on automobilia brings about all these objects, gives them a respect, gives them a value, and because of that, people will start understanding what they are, giving them more time and energy, and slowly becomes part of your daily life. The modern art auction, obviously, is what we've been doing for 20 years. It's the masters, 
the very finest art that India has produced from all the national art treasures like Nash, uh, Nicholas Rorick, Jan Miroy, Nandal Bose, to the masters like Souza, Raza, Hussain, um, Swaminathan, etc. Any other questions? Sir, uh, you've been preserving film memorabilia for so long and the automobile also somewhere uh, connects to the film memorabilia. So tell us about the connection. Well, look, the connection is like anything. You know, the automobile next to the house, the automobile is the most important object for a human being. Uh, first is your house, uske baad, uh, motor car. So, and India is about to become the second largest producer of con cars in the world next year. And yet she doesn't understand the history of this object because she's not been part of the manufacturing history. She's only been a great collector once upon a time because of the Rajas and the Maharajas. So, you need to integrate the vintage classic. Uh, you have to find, first of all, you know, if it's played a role, up bad they the seven cars, the Dodge, the Alfa Romeo, the Ford, the Singer. Each of them has such a huge journey. What was new about it? What was innovative about it? What was the design? What was the engineering? What was the nature of the combustion? Um, how many, where was it made? Where did it get exported? Who were the collectors? Who were the manufacturers? How many people were given jobs? What was the hist history of that car? How did it change the nation at that time? These are questions which may not be relevant today because we have so much information. But at the same time, you know, they all have a role. So we just need a few dedicated people. You don't need everyone to be interested. You need 5,000 dedicated students in this world who love the subject, who want to share the subject with the world, who want to study it, who want to research on it, who want to take it forward. And suddenly, you know, things change. And that's our job. You know, we are the great triggers. We create that inspiration, we energize people, we open things up, we make them respect it, fall in love, try to go deeper, take it forward, put the pieces of the jigsaw together and suddenly you have an infrastructure, you have an institution and maybe after that things start changing. It's a long journey. Everything takes minimum 30 years. In today's culture you ask anyone to sign a one-year bond, they'll have a nervous breakdown. You take away their phone from them, most of the young people will have a genuine physical reaction. So you've got a major problem with time. Anyway, that's going on beside the point. Any specific question? The last question I want to ask is, what is it, uh, can you tell us a little about the cost of the memorabilia, like the posters? What do well, you begin with and where do they The posters, uh, it depends on how rare the poster is. If you see behind you, you've got original artworks from the great collection of Maharaja Bhavnagar once upon a time. You've got posters outside of Hollywood films, Hindi films, you've got old maps, old signs, advertisements. So they start for as little as 10,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees some, all the way to a few lakhs. And um, it's a start, it's the first. So obviously this will be the cheapest because it's the first time. So it becomes an affordable art for the common man who wants Yes, to of course it's an it's a affordable collectible in the West. And it's, it's, it's affordable, um, you know, uh, it depends again who's affordable for the middle classes, the working class is still, but you don't have to always own things to love them or appreciate them. That's why so much of this culture is part of popular culture, people take photographs and hopefully that is enough. Thank you. Thank you everyone. All right.